In comparison to the Western Ghats, whose pastors have seen the movement of traders and monks from as early as the 1st century CE, the Eastern Ghats rarely feature an imagination of the past. But their peoples have been crucial to South India's history, especially the rich plains of Andhra Pradesh. They were courted by the 16th century emperors of Vijayanagara and were remarked upon by Mughal courtiers. Just last week, a Mughal painting of a Chenchu couple with courtly hunters was sold by Christie's for an eye-watering £693,000. But that's not all. From the Alvars of the Tamil Vaishnavite tradition to the temple patron warlords of 12th century Andhra Pradesh, the peoples of the Eastern Ghats have also participated in the evolution of Hinduism as we know it. This is especially clear through two temples that draw hundreds of thousands of pilgrims annually, the Raksharamam in the Godavari Delta and Ahobilam in the Eastern Ghats. I'm Anirudh Kanisati, historian author of Lord of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out the resources and citations below and remember that we're all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. On the bank of the river Godavari, which pours from the Deccan into the Andhra Pradesh coast, is the Shaivite temple of Draksharamam. Unassuming today, it was a site of extraordinary significance in the medieval period, especially from the 10th century to the 15th century CE. Like the Amareshwara temple at Amaravati, its linga was possibly repurposed from a Buddhist stupa in the 11th century. It was on the war-torn frontier between the Chalukya Empire of the Deccan and the Chora Empire of the Jeep South, drawing their patronage. Royals from Odisha and officials from Sri Lanka also made appearances there, seeking to advertise their devotion and proximity to its god. But what I want to explore here is just one strand of its history, its long-lasting links with the Boyas, a warlike people, originally hunter-gatherers, active from the Deccan to Tamil Nadu. In their paper, Kings, Temples and Legitimation of Autochthonous Communities, a Case Study for South Indian Temple, historians P.S. Kanakadurga and Y.A. Sudhakar Reddy studied 390 inscriptions on the temple walls. Unfolding over 400 years, these inscriptions also reveal a social history of the Boyas, from their unassuming arrival on the coast to their emergence as warlords and royal officials. Originally from the Nallamalla ranges of the Eastern Ghats, the Boyas appear to have migrated to the coast, seeking opportunities in the endless warfare of medieval Andhra politics. The region stabilized in the late 11th century when a prince of Andhra descent took the Chola throne as Kulotunga I. Thereafter, a number of local lords, working as Chola officials, tried to recruit Boya manpower for themselves. Durga and Reddy found that 882 Boyas were named the temple inscriptions from 1039 to 1453, initially as custodians of the temple cattle. Within a hundred years, by which time Chora power in the region had faded, Boyas of Draksharama were named as military men, bodyguards, and as the owners of villages. By the 13th century, they were being mentioned as royal ministers and officials, undertaking public works and making gifts to the temple. Of course they would. From the medieval Boya perspective, their ties to the god of Draksharama had quite literally awarded them with growing wealth and status in the world. But this status was disputed by other castes who saw the Boyas as upstarts. Many Boya priests claimed to be Brahmins. In Edgar Thurston's Castes and Tribes of South India, a colonial era ethnographic project which involved extensive field research, they were recorded as claiming descent from a Brahmin bandit who went on to become the sage Valmiki. In other legends, as noted by Durga and Reddy, they are said to be descended from Nishada, a horrid figure banished to the forest in the Mahabharata. While agrarian society needed the boyas and used them as mercenaries and officials, it never granted them exalted Kshatriya status. The medieval caste system was, however, hierarchical. It had many competing players, all with shifting status with regard to each other. The boyas were higher status than another hunter-gatherer group that remained in the Eastern Ghats, the Chenjus. The boyas claimed to be the only legitimate descendants of Nishada, thus according them a place, even if lowly, in the grand mythos of the Mahabharata. But as recorded by Thurston, they argued that the Chenchus were Nishada's illegitimate offspring, thus ensuring that the Boya status was marginally higher. But the Chenchus had their own claim to fame. Across the hilltops of the Eastern Ghats, they worshipped gods in the form of pillars, variously appropriated by Buddhists, Shaivites, and Vaishnavites. They shared this practice with the hill peoples of present-day Odisha, one of whose pillar deities, Stambheshwari, we saw in an earlier edition of Thinking Medieval. Pillars also became integral to myths of Narasimha around this time. He is depicted emerging from a pillar to rescue his devotee Prahlada from his demonic father. In her paper, Evolution of the Narasimha Legend as Possible Sources, historian Suvira Jaiswal argued that the pillar in these myths was an idea assimilated from hill peoples. One major change to site was Simhachalam, first taken over by Shaivites. By the 11th century, it was a stronghold of Vaishnavites who claimed that the divine man-lion Narasimha had manifested himself in the Shivalinga. 
this Linga was, according to Jaiswal, originally a sacred pillar god of the hill peoples. But perhaps the most important hill temple of the time was to Narasimha at Alhobilam, studied by Professor Aloka Parashar Sen in her book Gender, Religion and Local History, The Early Deccan. Here, from the 15th century onwards, sculptors were commissioned depicting a local legend. A beautiful Chenchu woman called Chencheta was believed to have charmed Narasimha. The god, depending on the source, either immediately took her to Ahobilam or wooed her and paid the surrounding bamboo forest to the Chenchus as a bride price. Though called Chenchu Lakshmi, the goddess is nevertheless not Narasimha's primary consort of the temple. That status is reserved for Lakshmi herself. The variations of the story, according to Professor Sain, reveal ambiguities in how the Chenchu saw themselves in relation to Ahobila. On the one hand, Chenchu legends, recorded by Thurston, claim that the goddess Chenchita, unhappy with being carried off, ordained that Chenchu girls would no longer be as charming as her. This would keep them safe from covetous eyes, including those of Nawabs and Sahibs. The Vijayanagara Emperor Krishnaraya, who also appeared in the previous edition of Thinking Medieval, also made gifts at Ahobilam in the 16th century. He wrote with annoyance of his dealings with the hill peoples. Trying to clean up the forest folk is like trying to wash a mud wall, he grumbled. There's no end to it. No point in getting angry. Make promises that you can keep and win them over. They'll be useful for invasions or plundering an enemy's land. It's irrational for a ruler to punish a thousand when a hundred are at fault." End quote. Evidently, at least some hill peoples raided Vijayanagara territories or otherwise created trouble. But gifts made by upper caste royals had a lasting impact. As the Ahobilam complex expanded, some Chenchus proudly claimed descent from Narasimha, others regard him as their in-law. Many today participate in Ahobilam's rituals and wear the Vaishnavite mark on their forehead. And the legend of Chenchuta spread far beyond the Eastern Ghats. The god Shiva at Sri Salam is also believed to have married a Chenchu woman. And to my surprise, I even saw this legend depicted in a carving at the Someshwara Temple in Alsur, near my former workplace in Bangalore. In the 17th or 18th century carving, the god, in the guise of a hunter, is depicted helping Chenchita remove a thorn from her foot. He is then shown proudly fetching two deer as a bride price to marry her. Hundreds of years of conflict and accommodation, interactions between the ancient peoples of forest, hill and field, distilled into the charming stone faces of a god and goddess. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Akanisati. We'll see you next week.